Hey friends, today we're going to be talking about analyzing hypotheses and uh, one thing I want to point out is hypotheses are useful as long as you plan ahead down the line. So a lot of times when we write our hypotheses, it's early in the process, right? We've um, maybe come up with our research questions uh, and we want to say, okay, this is the answers I think we're going to see, all right? Because your hypotheses, of course, are the answers to the questions you're posing. But I think a lot of times when we write these, we don't consider how they might be directly answered. This is me looking to the future, by the way. This is the future over here. We don't think about how in the future they might be answered by our data and what kind of analyses we might have to run and all the things that come along with chapters four and five of your thesis that you don't really think about when you're writing chapters one, two, and three. So that's what this lecture is about a little bit. And uh, I want to kind of show you how you might format certain hypotheses so that they might be more easily addressed later on when you gather your, gather your data. Gather your data? Gather your data? I don't know. Where's my cursor here? Oh, that's not a good start. Oh, there it goes. There we go. All right. All right. So correlational hypotheses. A lot of you will write correlational hypotheses, right? And, and in correlational study, this is where we're just looking to see how one thing and another thing interact. We're not trying to manipulate anything. We're not trying to change anything. We're simply just observing what's going on, right? So with a correlational hypothesis, you're really just trying to see what happens with variables, variables X and Y. Not in a causational way, just in a relational way, right? And for example, I've got two different flavors here for your correlational hypotheses. One is directional, one's non-directional. I'll tell you the difference in a second. But for directional, for example, as temperature decreases, right, amount of clothing worn increases, right? And we can see this actually. So right now I'm recording this video and it's November, December, something, right? And it's getting colder and people, the amount of clothes people are wearing goes up, right? So uh, shirt jacket, scarf, hat, whatever, it starts to go up. So what we're doing is we're seeing a change in the uh, temperature that's reflected in a change in the amount of clothes worn. And this is directional because you're saying, I expect this relationship to take place in a certain direction, right? You expect clothing, uh, uh, temperature to go down and clothing to go up and vice versa, right? So you're saying as it gets warmer, the amount of clothes worn will go the other direction, right? So as it gets hotter, people tend to wear less clothes. Right? This is the directional hypothesis. Non-directional is going to be a little bit more vague, a little bit more general, right? This one here, there's a significant relationship between temperature and clothing worn. Notice I'm saying basically the same thing as the first hypothesis, but in this case, I'm being less specific about it. I'm just saying there's a connection. I don't know if clothing goes up as temperature goes down or vice versa. I, I don't know what's going on, but I know there's a relationship. And that word relationship is a functional trigger of a correlational hypothesis. If you see the word relationship in a, in a definition or in a, in a hypothesis like this, you know that a correlation needs to be run. And so, as I said, go ahead and provide hypotheses that tell you and your reader exactly what kind of analysis you need to do on the back end. You need to be deliberate about this and it will make your life so much easier and better in chapter four when you go to run your analysis. All right. Directional versus non-directional. There's not really a superior one, by the way. Um, you can use either one. It's up to you. Uh, a lot of it has to do with what the prior research says. So if prior research has given you the reason to believe there is a good directional hypothesis, then use it. If this is a new research, new exploratory research, you could say, I don't really know. So we're just going to say there is something going on. I don't know what the relationship looks like, but there's something going on. Okay. So correlational hypotheses. Why doesn't the key... There we go. All right. Oops, I think I skipped one. Yeah, there it is. All right. Cool, cool. So t-tests. In this case, what we're doing is we're looking for a difference, either a difference between two groups or a difference between before and after, um, a difference between a small group and a larger population, whatever. But there are three flavors of t-tests. And by the way, when you make your hypotheses, you might have, say, three hypotheses. So you might end up with one correlation and two t-tests or uh, two correlations and an ANOVA whatever. They don't all have to match. So with three hypotheses, you might actually have three different statistical procedures, and that's fine. And to be very honest with you, as someone who served as a chair and a committee member on like countless theses and dissertations, I actually like to see good variability among the tests that you run. If you only run correlation, okay, <clears throat> that's fine, I suppose. But if you can say, oh, I ran a correlation for this hypothesis, a independent samples t-test for this hypothesis, and then the last one I used regression analysis or uh, an ANOVA or whatever. As a committee member, I think, ooh, la la, these people know their stats, right? So I'm just throwing it out there. It's not it's not a deal breaker if you don't, but it kind of adds to the, to the work. So the first one there. Independent samples t-test, and um, there are videos as part of this class that are talk that talk more about these different tests um, in detail. But independent samples t-test is making a comparison across two groups 
that don't overlap, right? So um, let's say uh, men and women uh, in a biological sense. So we won't use gender, we'll use biological sex, right? So men and women, like so. And what I'm saying in this hypothesis, for example, are women, this is the women on the right, my right, uh, women are significantly smarter than men. So I'm making comparison across two different groups, and I'm saying this group is going to be significantly smarter than this group, or more accurately, the data will indicate this group is significantly smarter than this group, right? Um, and in this sort of case too, it's it. I, my hypothesis can be very deliberate. You might say, um, you know, um, college seniors study more than college juniors, right? You're making a direct comparison here. And when you run your data, you can just group all the seniors together and all the juniors together, and then just make a comparison using this independent samples t-test. This is a really good way to go, by the way, if you want to, um, I'm trying to think, if you want to emphasize the difference going on between groups, um, and there's all sorts of groups you can compare. Uh, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of research on uh, Republicans and Democrats, right? So I would use an independent samples t-test. It'd be really uncommon to see someone who is like a Republican Democrat or a Democratic Republican. That doesn't make sense, right? So you've got two groups, and this test is really useful for that because you can say, is there a difference? And not only is there a difference, but is there a significant difference, as the hypothesis indicates? And before I get too much further, I want to point out too, notice none of these hypotheses are terribly lengthy, right? If we look at the last page, you know, a, a relatively short sentence in either case. This one here, this uh, first one here, is six words long. Hypotheses should be concise. They don't need to be some sort of long, it shouldn't take more than one sentence. Your hypothesis should be just one sentence. And in some cases, it can be very, very brief as it is in uh, that first point there. So anyway, parent samples test. This is going to be when you're kind of examining before and after or two groups that overlap a little bit. Uh, it's uncommon. Let me go ahead and throw it out there. This would probably be the least common hypothesis of the ones we're talking about today. So, and, and this is not really psychological research, but for example, trucks value depreciates significantly from original purchase price to five-year resale value, right? So what we're saying basically is if you buy a truck, any truck today, it's going to be worth significantly less in five years, right? And so what I would do is get a large sample of trucks, say 30, 40 different types of trucks, and examine their sale price today, and then examine the resale price in five years. So it's one group, obviously, that overlaps because it's the same group tested twice, when it's originally sold, and then later on, five years down the line, right? So one group essentially tested twice. As I said, very uncommon. Um, you could do something like this for uh, the IQ of college freshmen versus the IQ of the same freshmen when they become seniors, all right? So as they come into college as versus how they are when they leave college. Um, good test, but as I said, not very often used uh, uh, by uh, students doing their thesis. Last one here, there's one sample t-test. This is going to be um, comparing a sample, right? So this is me with a small sample compared to a larger population. Right? So obviously sticking to the cars theme, there are any number of cars out there that you might buy. And luxury cars, you have your choice. There's a lot of them. What I'm saying is luxury cars, as a subsample, cost significantly more than $40,000. Alright? So what I could do to test this is I could go to, um, I could actually take a field trip and go to a local Mercedes-Benz dealership and write down all the sale prices and just do an average and say, okay, how much does the average sale price of these 40 cars or these 60 cars, whatever, what is it? And compare it against this. <clears throat> um, with the one sample, this is also fairly uncommon, but you always provide a value. So 40,000 in this case is the value that I provide. Um, as I said, fairly uncommon. That first one is very common, but the next two don't get used a whole lot in uh, theses. ANOVA. Right? ANOVA, by the way, is going to have a trigger phrase two. You'll see it in all three of these sentences. Main effect, main effect, main effect. Main effect is the trigger phrase you want to use if you're going to run an ANOVA. And as a quick refresher, ANOVA is used when we have more than two groups that we're analyzing. Right? So if you're looking at freshmen, sophomore, juniors, seniors, right? That would be more than two groups, obviously. Uh, so that's why I've got the first one. Significant main effect of year in school on hours spent studying. All right? So you're comparing all four groups at once. You're not doing a series of t-tests, you're just doing one ANOVA, right? Uh, significant main effect of type of dog breed and amount of food eaten, eaten, right? So there are hundreds of dog breeds. So in this case, you couldn't just do a t-test because t-tests can only handle up to two groups. So you would look at all of the dog breeds at once by running an ANOVA. And of course, you would find this data backs it up because obviously um, Great Danes are going to eat a lot more than little chihuahuas and Pomeranians and whatnot. Right, and there's a significant effect of a uh, significant main effect, excuse me, of car manufacturer on sale price of cars. Right, so you might go to a Honda dealership and expect to be able to buy a new car for less than twenty five thousand. Right, I don't know, it's been a while since I bought a car. 
but um, you probably wouldn't go to a Mercedes-Benz dealership and expect to be able to buy a brand new car for less than 25000 What we're seeing here is a significant main effect. Basically, the type of manufacturer has a significant effect on how much you're expected to pay. Right. And I think this is you might be hearing me say this and think, well, of course, absolutely, because I'm not going to expect to buy a Lamborghini for less than one hundred thousand. Right. But I would be wouldn't pay one hundred thousand dollars for a Hyundai. Exactly. That's where these ANOVA analyses come in. Um, these are a really good type of analysis, fairly commonly used, easy to run, but they can provide incredible insights for your thesis. So I'd really recommend this. Um, not hard to understand, but what you can talk about in chapters four and five really explode uh, in a good way with uh, ANOVA. So the last one I want to share with you guys today, um, not because this is all of the uh, uh, analyses you could do, but because these are the most common, is regression. Um, in this case, the word predict is going to be your trigger word. This is me pointing. I probably should use my cursor here, wherever it is. Predictors, predict, predict, right? The term predict is the trigger word that should indicate that you need to run this particular type of um, analysis. So uh, GPA and SAT are significant predictors of college success. Obviously, that's why they use them as, as part of the college entrance requirements. Temperature and humidity significantly predict amount of clothing worn. In Houston, we should know this, right? And then age and gender significantly predict the amount one pays in auto insurance. And this is why, for example, a 16-year-old male is going to pay a whole lot less than a 50-year-old female. Or excuse me, a whole lot more. My bad. Way more. Way more. A 16-year-old male will pay way more than a 50-year-old uh, a female because the data indicates that that 16-year-old male is much more likely to get into a car accident than the 50-year-old female, right? So what we're using here is we're using X variables to predict a Y, right? So age and gender are X, Y is auto insurance premium, right? Temperature and humidity are X, uh, clothing worn is the Y. GPA and SAT, both X's, college success is the Y. So these are going to be a little bit more complex because you have to look at a, a little bit more analyses. But I will say as a committee member and chair, this really makes the committee very interested. And it kind of goes a little bit beyond what's expected for a typical thesis. So if you're really trying to, you know, just bury it and show them how smart you are and how much you've learned, this is a really good way to go. Um, particularly if you're looking at something that is a natural um uh, kind of naturally leads to prediction, right? So SAT and stuff like this, and you'd be amazed at how much of it's out there. Okay. So as I said, uh, you know, a, a moment of forethought when writing your hypotheses is going to save you so much hard work on the back end. So I hope and pray that you listen to what we said, I said today um, and internalize some of this so that when you go to write your hi uh, research questions and your hypotheses, you've laid a good framework for how you can answer them when you gather your data and go to write chapters four and five.